Uh, we will talk about uh, OCaml uh, and uh, probably the next version to come. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, so thank you, Sylvain. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, so we are welcome to uh, this meeting and thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, tell you what's uh, what's been going on and what is going on right now in the uh, well on, uh, on the core camel system and what, what we've been doing since the last meeting, what we are going to do uh, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, before that, uh, let me uh, uh, thank uh, a few persons uh, who were instrumental in getting this meeting uh, uh, to happen. Uh, first and foremost, uh, so Sylvain Le Gall from Camel Corps, uh, who for the third time did uh, uh, most of the organization. Uh, then there's uh, Inaya uh, Paris Oconco Conference Bureau, and especially uh, Mrs. Chantal Giraudon, uh, which is sitting just outside, uh, for the local arrangements. And, uh, and uh, this is all uh, funded uh, by the Camel Consortium. Uh, so you see there are some uses to the Camel Consortium, like, uh, <laughs> I like paying for this room and a nice lunch you're going to have um, uh, at noon. All right, so... Um, um, so, so this is what I will be talking about. So, rather briefly, a uh, oh, few news is a uh, few news about uh, the development uh, of Camel, um, our various releases. Uh, then, uh, briefly again, uh, some news about the uh, Camel Consortium itself. And so, most of my presentation <coughs> will be uh, on describing uh, the new language features that are to appear in OCaml 3.12, and there are. Uh, surprisingly many, um, and and then some remarks to conclude. All right, so let's start. Um, so recent releases since the last uh, meeting. So two uh, minor releases, uh, bug fix releases, uh, 3.11.1 in uh, uh, June 2009, fixing about 45 uh, problem reports. And another one, 3.11.2 in January this year, fixing about 32 and with uh, uh, quite a few improvements on the, and uh, updates on the debugger, on Camel Debug, so thanks to Xavier Claire for his work, and a few old uh, feature wishes were uh, granted. All right, so that's, uh, uh, that's kind of routine. So the next release will be a major release, uh, 3.12.0, uh, with, again, surprisingly many new language features. Um, well, that's a teaser for the end of the talk. Uh, more bug fixing, more wish granting, and uh, we've been careful uh, uh, to preserve backward compatibility. So currently there's only uh, one known um, and uh, voluntary uh, backward incompatible change. And that has to do with the string to integer uh, conversion functions, which used to accept the uh, string literal representing max int plus one and silently turn it into min int. So well, there were bad reasons for doing that. And, uh, and those have gone. So now that will those functions will fail uh, in this particular case. Uh, and I hope this is not going to break too much of your code, but uh, well, we will see. Uh, all right, so uh, here is the tentative planning. So I'm happy to announce that the uh, uh, that we've done a feature freeze. So now we know what's going in, and uh, so in the coming uh, two months, say we will uh, finish uh, merging. So some of those new features are still uh, on branches. Uh, document writing documentation, updating Camel P4 and Camel Doc accordingly, and doing more bug fixing. Uh, I hope to have a first beta release in early June, or maybe even late May, um, and for a final re release uh, in early July, before the summer break. And as usual, uh, well, testing and feedback from you uh, is much appreciated. Uh, so either if you track the, uh, the subversion trunk, or, uh, or uh, at least uh, when we release uh, beta versions. Uh, okay, so a few words about manpower. It's always been the Achilles heel of, uh, of OCaml's development. So it is on the rise, especially thanks to 
uh, external contributors. So Alain Frisch from Lexify did a lot of work on, uh, on the new features. And, uh, and more recently, uh, Mark Chinwell from uh, Jane Street uh, also joined uh, the, uh, uh, the core camel development team. And we are, we are very happy to have both of them on board. And then there's the usual suspects, so the historic Enria uh, team, that <coughs> makes me feel very old. Uh, so, especially Damien Delige and I. Uh, so, Jacques Gary, who's at Nagoya University in Japan, is still active, and some of the new features uh, were actually developed by him. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so we have uh, Xavier Claire uh, contributing as well. So, he is an Enria research programmer, and he uh, splits his time between several uh, research projects. And one of them being Camel. So in the end, we have uh, the equivalent of about one person full time, uh, which is still about twice as much as uh, what we had uh, two or three years ago. And I'm also glad to announce that the uh, legal status of contributions from outside in area was clarified, and the answer is called a contributor license agreement. That's basically a piece of paper that says uh, well, that you, the contributor, keeps uh, keep the copyright, but you grant in a year uh, the rights to do whatever it pleases with your code, and you also give up on any patent claims, if any. And so that's kind of a standard procedure. Uh, the Apache Foundation, for instance, uses this for all its contributions. Sorry, <laughs> uh, for all these contributions, but it's still uh, more lightweight than the uh, copyright assignments that the Free Software Foundation use. Uh, in a copyright assignment, you give up your, all your rights uh, on your code, and that doesn't fly well with French law. Okay, so um, uh, so that's one less uh, one less thing to worry about. All right, so a few words about the consortium. Um, so we have one new member this year. Uh, it's uh, ML State, which is a startup company based in Paris and uh, doing uh, web programming, let's say, uh, server-side <coughs> programming. Uh, I don't know if anyone from ML State is here today. Okay. Um, so you um, so you may know uh, David Teller, for instance, from his work on batteries, and he joined uh, ML State uh, uh, recently. Uh, and so that brings us to 11 members total. That's getting respectable. So this is a list of all uh, uh, of all members, and as you see, it's a fairly diverse uh, bunch. Uh, ranging from uh, a one-person company, Camel Core, to uh, many-person companies like Microsoft <laughs> and Intel. Uh, and, uh, and, and the kind of things they do with Camel is relatively varied as well. So, uh, for instance, there's, uh, well, Dassault system basically implements a domain-specific language. Uh, Microsoft uh, CEA uh, do static analysis tools uh, and 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 pro, pro, well, program verification tools in general. Um, so Lexify, Jane Street, and Simcorp are all in the uh, finance industry. So Jane Street is a trading firm. Lexify and Simcorp uh, provide software uh, for the financial industry. Uh, Citrix uses Camel for uh, to develop uh, system administration <coughs> tools for the Xen hypervisor, and uh, well, did I forget anyone? Yeah, and and basically that's so aviation and Intel, well, don't really use Camel at this point, but well, wish to support uh, support it, and we well, have a general interest in new programming languages for Intel and in uh, formal methods and verification tools for the aviation. Okay, um, and so just to remind me, the actions of the consortium, uh, so what it does, first and foremost, is to sell a uh, permissive license on the Camel code base. So it's basically a BSD license and it lets members do pretty much whatever they want with the code base. So in this sense, it's less, much less restrictive than the uh, default uh, LGPL plus QPL uh, license um, that, that Camel has. Uh, so it's, in, it's a lightweight way to, for, for a corporation to sponsor Camel a little bit. 
it's uh, it's intended as a place to discuss needs with uh, power users from, from industry. It's good for public relation or for us to justify our work uh, with respect to INRIA for uh, uh, potential uh, industrial users of Camel uh, who may be uh, reassured by uh, seeing well, so many uh, famous names uh, as members of the consortium. And then it brings some pocket money for well, the general operation of, of my research group, which is most welcome, and also for uh, paying for internships and uh, sponsoring this meeting, for instance. And so what is relatively new this year is that um, uh, actually, so this this uh, part, uh, the, the discussion of needs and, and actions, uh, is is really uh, working well. Um, uh, so nowadays, the consortium acts very much as a sounding board for discussing new features and needs. Uh, and uh, as I said, we have two members that, that contribute manpower uh, and, and, and can uh, contribute directly to the CAMEL code base. So we had uh, a meeting, so we have a yearly meeting. The last one was in December 2009 in Paris, and it was really well attended. Uh, so 12 participants, uh, 12 outside participants, plus four uh, in area persons. Uh, so some of the participants came from uh, New York and London and uh, Copenhagen. Uh, and we had some uh, very good discussions of possible extensions and future developments, uh, majority of which materialized in uh, 3.12.0. And, uh, and well, and, and those kind of, con of discussions continue on the consortium mailing list. Um, all right, so now the part that you've been all uh, waiting for, it's uh, the description of the new features. So that's a long list. Uh, there's no less than eight. Um, <clears throat> so, so let me go through them relatively quickly, and then uh, I keep uh, leave time in the end for uh, well, if you want to go back to some examples or um, uh, things like this. All right. So let's start with a small, uh, a small bit of syntactic sugar uh, about records. So in record patterns and record expressions, uh, so you can write just id instead of id equals id and m.id instead of m.id equals id. So here is an example. If you open the complex module, you get a type of complex numbers, which is a record with two <laughs> fields, re and im. And, and well, here is a way to construct a record. You can just say re im. And that really means re equals re, im equals im. And so if re and im are regular variables that are bound earlier, uh, those values are automatically taken uh, to fill the fields. And likewise, in a pattern, if you write re im, that stands for re equals re, im equals im, and that is going to bind uh, local variables re and im to the values of those two fields, and now you can use them uh, in the right hand side uh, as before or uh, with the new uh, syntactic sugar. So, well, that's no big deal, and uh, it's, it's been in standard ML for, uh, for a very long time. Oh, but well, it's still uh, notationally convenient. So another bit of uh, notation for records is that now at the end of a record pattern, you can put semicolon underscore, and that annotation means this pattern doesn't list all fields of the record type, but this is intentional. And so, uh, so continuing the uh, complex example, so if you write a pattern that only matches on the RE field but not on the IM field, um, then uh, you will now get a warning if uh, warning R is active. So don't worry, it's turned off by default. So. Uh, however, if you want to silence this warning, uh, you can put a write explicitly semicolon underscore, and that means that, that tells the compiler that yes, it is intentional that not all fields are listed. So this will never work. And so what's the usefulness of this? Uh, well, the idea is that well, if you have some record patterns that you intend to be exhaustive to list all fields, and then later you extend the record type with some new fields, uh, then the compiler will warn. And that can be uh, useful to basically see if something needs to be done uh, at that part in your code. 
Uh, and again, uh, where all this is turned off by default, so if you don't like it, uh, just don't turn the warning on and, uh, and uh, it will work just as before. Number two um, is a kind of similar in spirit. So tell the compiler a little more about your intent so that it can produce better errors and uh, warnings. So uh, it's in the uh, class, an uh, object language. And um, so we have uh, a new uh, uh, constructs, method bang and val bang and inherit bang. Which, so method bang, it defines a method just like the regular method keyword does. But it, uh, it tells the compiler that you intend to override a method of the same name that's already defined in a superclass. So here, for instance, we are subclassing from class C. And if we say method bang M, uh, then you will get an error if C doesn't already define the method named M, okay, if no overriding takes place. And symmetrically, if you define the method N, which is intended to be new, and uh, you will get, a w or you can get a warning if actually C defines a method already, uh, and that method is called N. And again, this is a warning that is turned off by default. Um, so, well, so similar annotations exist in other uh, O languages, like C Sharp, I believe, and O, uh, and it's quite effective at uh, catching misspellings. Basically, you, you wanted to override a method, but you got the name wrong, uh, or things like, uh, stupid things like this. Okay, so here you will get a little more uh, help from the compiler. All right, so let's move on. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> an, old, an old favorite uh, is the uh, local open. Um, so the ability to open a, uh, a structure and bring and, and lets you use its uh, components with short names, uh, but within the scope of an expression. Okay, so like here you're opening complex and so <coughs> you can use short names for RE and IM. So, well, it's uh, it's been asked for a very long time and uh, I caved into popular demand. And also, well, there was a, there is a camel p4 extension that implements this using uh, local modules, but it's not very robust. In particular, if your expression here uh, contains type variables that cannot be generalized, uh, then uh, then you get an error, I think, with the camel p4 extension because of the struct that you have to put around. Uh, while here, well, it just works like a regular let. Okay, question, comment? Okay. Um, and why do we were at it? Uh, so Alain Frisch suggested uh, some syntactic sugar for let open M in E, which is just M dot parenthesis E parenthesis. So, well, if you're familiar with Christoph uh, Trostler's delimited overloading uh, uh, package, that, uh, that will be familiar to you, but, well, it's, it's much less uh, powerful than Christoph's uh, uh, package, but still it has a little bit of the same flavor. So the idea is that, for instance, if you have a module float that defines uh, the usual arithmetic operators, plus, star, etc., then uh, you can do float dot, and then an expression where star plus etc. will be resolved uh, according to those definitions. Okay. So again, if you want more, like a uh, cle uh, clever interpretation of literals and so on, uh, you're better off using uh, Christoph's uh, delimited overloading extension. But just this little bit of syntax can already be useful, and I think, uh, well, I'd be interested to see what library writers uh, or people who do I don't know, the core library from Jane Street or the uh, or batteries and so on, uh, uh, could, uh, could do uh, with this notation. All right, so now for something slightly bigger, polymorphic <coughs> recursion. Um, so the gist of the extension is uh, just that uh, variables bound by let or let rec can now receive an explicit polymorphic type so those explicit polymorphic types are written, uh, well, uh, quote A, quote B, quote C, dot uh, type expression in camel. And that really means uh, for all uh, alpha, uh, vi uh, type variables, alpha, beta, gamma, uh, some type. 
And so, for instance, if you want to define the identity function, you can declare it with this uh, polymorphic type. And in this case, that would be OK. But if you get the definition wrong, like uh, here, then you will get an error. The compiler will tell you that this has type uh, beta or int, which is not uh, uh, as general as uh, for all alpha, alpha or alpha. And you should uh, contrast this with the with regular uh, type constraints. So if you just put id uh, alpha r alpha, this really means uh, there exists some alpha such that uh, id has this type. And so in this case, uh, this definition is OK, and alpha becomes int. OK, and you get the function of type int r int. All right, so unlike regular uh, type constraints, those uh, polymorphic type constraints are uh, reliable. Okay, so, so we know that the final type of ID will be exactly this and not something less general. So now we can use it, uh, use those uh, optional uh, declarations to type check uh, recursive definitions better. Uh, namely, we can now have uh, recursive definitions where the uh, recursively bound functions can be used at several types within the recursion, several different types within the recursion, and that's the essence of uh, polymorphic recursion. And well, here is an example. Say you have a type of terms that contains in particular various association lists. So here is a list of string type time term, and here is a list of int time term, and then you want to uh, recurse over uh, those terms, do some processing, and with an auxiliary function, mutually recursive function, that is going to process lists, uh, association lists. Okay, but here it will be called with a string uh, parameter, type parameter, and here with an int type parameter. So if you try to write this in Camel today and you just erase this constraint, uh, it's not going to work because you are using shift list with two different types within the same definition, and that's not allowed. However, uh, if you put a uh, type uh, explicit polymorphic type uh, constraint, then the compiler is going to use it and see that uh, everything is OK, uh, those two calls are OK, and this definition is actually polymorphic enough. All right, so that's a simple example uh, of use of polymorphic recursion. So there are more advanced examples that involve uh, so-called non-regular recursive data types, so basically uh, type T, uh, sorry, alpha T that uh, recurses, for instance, on uh, alpha list T. OK, so, so T, but with a different uh, type parameter. So this you can write in CAMEL or in standard ML uh, today, but you basically cannot write any interesting recursive function on it because, uh, because it needs to be polymorphically recursive. And so now you can write functions over those uh, weird and regular de recursive data types, and they even have some uses. So if you look at uh, Kazaki's uh, amortized uh, data structures, some of them actually use uh, non-regular recursive data types. All right. Uh, oh, another really big one is uh, first class modules. So that's, uh, that's basically uh, the ability to encapsulate a module as a core language value, okay? So which then can be carried around uh, just like any uh, core language value, just like an integer or a function or a record. Uh, put into data structures, put into references, whatever, and uh, later you can uh, recover the <coughs> module uh, from this value and, and use it in a module context, like as an argument to a functor or whatever. And so syntactically, so at the level of expressions, there is a module uh, injection that takes any module x and an explicit type for it and returns a first class value whose type is uh, this new, new form of type, module, uh, some package type. And then uh, in a context expecting a module, you can write val of an expression, which must have a module type, so which, which must be uh, one of those first-class modules, and extract it with, again with an explicit type. And so the types in question here, uh, so these are not arbitrary module types because that would make uh, type checking and type inference for the core language uh, way too complicated. So it's a subset of uh, module types consisting of a name, which is basically the name of a signature, something you've defined with module type S equal. 
Uh, plus optional uh, constraints, uh, so substituting some type components uh, with some type expressions. And so, uh, so this is basically an extension of an earlier proposal by Claudio Russo, uh, which uh, has been part of Moscow ML for a while. And so the main extension is that in, in uh, Claudio's uh, proposal, uh, uh, the package type was just a name of a signature. And so Alain added the, uh, the possibility to, to change some of the parameters, uh, to, to add some types basically as parameters. Uh, that brings useful additional flexibility. Uh, and of course, so those types are compared by name on this part and by structure on the, uh, on the toes. All right, so what can you do with that? Well, the, perhaps the most typical use is uh, well, to, uh, well, to select at runtime among several implementations of a signature. So here is a, a synthetic example. So say you have a program that uh, outputs uh, graphics in various formats. So you can define a, a type of uh, devices, module type of device, which is an output device with various functions. And then uh, uh, initialize a hash table mapping names of devices to first class modules implementing this uh, signature. Okay. And then, uh, well, you can uh, register various implementations of the device, like maybe uh, an implementation that generates SVG. Uh, and, uh, and so you add to the table with the name SVG, the first class module obtained from module SVG viewed with uh, type device. And likewise, maybe in another file, you will have a PDF uh, output module that you will register with name PDF. And then, again, in some other part of your program, you can now uh, pass a command line to, to see what uh, device the user wants. Uh, look, look at that uh, name into the uh, hash table. So that gives you a value of type, first class value of type module device, <coughs> which you can then project into uh, the, the module language using this val device uh, constraint. And then you get a regular module, which you can bind and use uh, later uh, throughout your program. Okay. Um, so that makes the uh, module language a lot less static. Okay. You can really do, uh, well, uh, more, more computations or, uh, uh, and more uh, runtime choices uh, when it comes to modules. So there are plenty of other uh, uses, and if you're interested, you should talk to uh, Alain Frisch, and uh, he has uh, some nifty demos to show you. Um, so one example is uh, to write functors that take a list of structures as argument of arbitrary lengths. Uh, so this has some uses in uh, static analysis in particular, when you construct domains. And so that now will be expressed as a function, a recursive function that will take a list of first class structures, okay, and produce a first class structure. And, uh, uh, but that, that can be, uh, that can be written. You can do the recursive construction and everything. Uh, it provides an encoding of uh, existentials, so uh, first class values with existential types. Um, uh, so it's, it is an encoding, so it's slightly heavy, but, uh, but, but the expressive power is here. And uh, actually more generally than just existentials, uh, uh, some forms of generalized algebraic data types uh, uh, can also be encoded. Again, at some cost in, in verbosity, but uh, uh, well, the expressive power is here and the resulting code is reasonably efficient. All right, so three more to go. Um, number six is the ability to uh, name uh, types or type variables as parameters to functions. So basically in the parameter list of a function where well, you can have variables, you can have patterns, but now you can also have this uh, parenthesis type T parenthesis uh, construct which uh, basically is a formal parameter. And the effect is that within the function, 
the name T exists and it's a new abstract type name. Okay, like, I don't know, like int or, uh, uh, or float. Um, but outside, when you leave the scope of this declaration, this T becomes a regular type variable alpha from the core language, and then it can be generalized or instantiated uh, as usual, uh, following the, the rules of the core language. And so this uh, parameter has no runtime effect, so no type is actually passed at runtime. Okay, it's just, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a way to uh, bridge uh, module level constructs and core level polymorphism. And here is a simple example. Uh, say you want to sort and remove duplicates in a list. Okay. Uh, so if that's a monomorphic list, if it's a list of integers, for instance, you could easily use a set uh, uh, module to do this. So you would construct using set that make uh, a, a set of integers uh, type, a module, and then you can insert all elements of the list in the set. And since it's a set, uh, duplicates will be removed, and uh, and then uh, ask for the elements of the sets, which is a sorted list. And so mission accomplished. Uh, the problem is that now, uh, how to do that if you want this function to be polymorphic and work over any uh, any lists and uh, given any comparison function? Well, now you can do this. So you're going to declare sort unique with uh, one of those type S uh, uh, formal parameters, and then a comparison function over S's, and then a list of S's. And now S is a type name, okay, so you can uh, use it to define a structure of, uh, well, a structure that you can pass to set.make. So apply set.make to a type which is S and a comparison function which is a provided one. Then you can do the, uh, the little hack I mentioned earlier, so insert all elements uh, of L in, in, uh, starting from the empty set, asking for the elements. And at this point, you get an S list as a result. And now, when you leave the scope, uh, so S becomes alpha, and since it is generalizable, it is generalized, and so you get the expected type for sort unique. Okay, it's a regular type for a sorting function. Uh, another example, uh, uh, declaring local exceptions in polymorphic functions. So exception E of alpha of quote A uh, doesn't work in camel and for good reasons because, uh, uh, well, that would introduce uh, unsoundness. Uh, however, uh, you can do uh, something similar but sound uh, using this new notation. So again, so this is a function that basically just takes uh, T and then a dummy parameter, declares an exception E taking T's uh, within the local module, and then returns the injection function from t to exn and the projection function from exn to option t. And again, when you leave the scope of this t, uh, uh, it becomes a type variable and it is generalized. So you get this type for new exn. And, uh, well, and then that, that kind of things can be useful basically to have an extensible data type uh, uh, for putting uh, various data uh, in it. All right, and, and, and that extension goes very well with the first class module extension also. Okay, so the last two are also about uh, modules, but more about the uh, module type language and the language of signatures. Um, so number seven is the ability to recover the type uh, inferred for a module expression. So it's written module type of M. And if, if you don't understand what that means, uh, well, I guess, I guess you understand what that means, but it's basically M is any module expression and module type of M is going to give you its module type and it can be used in any module type context, in particular, uh, <coughs> including signatures. So the main use is uh, to enrich the signature of an existing module. So say you, you take the hash table module from uh, the standard library and you want to add some functionality like this add all that takes all bindings of T1 and insert them into uh, table T2. 
then that can be written quite concisely. The implementation can already be written quite concisely. So basically you include uh, the module hash table and then you add uh, the value fields uh, you want. However, so until uh, until now, the uh, writing an explicit signature for this my hash uh, module was a complete pain because basically you had to duplicate, to cut and paste the actual signature of uh, hash table, okay, and add uh, the declaration you want at the end. Uh, oh, sorry, there's uh, a bit of a typo here. Uh, <laughs> so forget everything from the L to the uh, first semicolon. Okay, uh, and so now, well, you can write the signature for my hash just by saying uh, include the module type of hash table. So that brings all the fields and types of hash table in uh, in the signature, and then just declare the new uh, the new uh, fields. Okay, and so we hope that will make it easier to basically enrich uh, signatures uh, a posteriori. And. Extension number eight, uh, last but not least, uh, has uh, similar uh, motivations. So again, it's uh, how to do more things with uh, signatures, and especially uh, uh, modify them or reuse them a posteriori. And so it's a new form of uh, the with uh, type, uh, or actually with module also uh, uh, modifier that you're familiar with. Uh, so this new form is like this, so S, where S is some uh, signature expression, uh, with type T colon equal tau, so tau being a type expression. And the effect of this is to uh, delete the declaration of the type T member from signature S, and then uh, replace uh, all uses of T in S with tau. Okay, so that that, that keeps the signature well formed. And uh, so contrast this with the regular uh, with type uh, constraint. So with type T equals uh, tau, uh, which you have today, and whose effect is to enrich the declaration. So it's going to change type T into type T equals tau. So the rest of the signature now knows that T and tau are morally the same thing, but it keeps the declaration of T. So in so in, in this signature, you still have a T component, and in that signature, you don't have any. And so the application is, uh, well, to combine uh, signatures that have identically named types, uh, type components. So say you have S1 and S2 that both define a type T and uh, various operations over uh, those types. And now you would like to write the combined signature S1 plus 2, that is a signature of modules that have uh, type T and both sets of operations. So uh, here is one way to write it. Uh, you say, without duplicating, without cutting and pasting all that, you just say sig type T, include S1 with T colon equals T. So what this does, it deletes this T, and then it substitutes T's here, by uh, the new T here, okay? And likewise, include S2 with T colon equal T, uh, and in the end, so you will get a T component, all those val components, and all these val components, which is what you wanted at the beginning. And actually, if you're lazy, you can write that uh, this way. You can just include S1 whole, that will bring a T in context, and then include S2 with T becomes T, uh, which is going to uh, remove that <coughs> other T and uh, use this T for those operations. And that's the kind of uh, signature surgery that you cannot do with regular uh, with type T equals tau constraints, because uh, if you were to use those constraints here, multiple T components would remain. So here three, one here, one here, one here, and here uh, two, one, two. And and uh, and that's an ambiguous signature, and the uh, the type checker would uh, reject that. All right. So I hope this is the end of the list of features. Yes. Uh, so well, let me conclude briefly, and then uh, then we'll have uh, some time for uh, questions and uh, comments. <coughs> All right, so, well, I hope uh, hope you will like uh, OCaml 3.12. And so how can you help? I'm, I'm hearing that question in the audience. Uh, thank you very much for asking it. Uh, well, again, by testing, providing feedback as much as you can. Uh, that's really uh, precious to us because, uh, well, testing is 
well, we do a little bit in house with a few applications, uh, a few key applications, but uh, well, basically. We, we, we still uh, need help uh, from the community. Uh, so if you want uh, 3.12 to work, uh, well, if you want your favorite uh, camel program to work with uh, 3.12, uh, the best thing to do is to test uh, 3.12 with that program. Um, uh, so I'm still hoping to get uh, some volunteers to work on part of the system that we handle really badly. And again, I'm thinking about the Windows port and the Windows binary distributions. So I'm the only one in the whole Camel team who ever touches Windows. Um, okay, all others <laughs> just recoil in uh, horror. No, that's not right. Alain, Alain does a little bit of Windows as well because, uh, well, he has to, I guess. <laughs> yeah, because that's what the customers want. Um, Lexi fights customers. But anyway, so yeah, so Alan and I do a little bit of Windows, but uh, still it's not a pleasure at all, and uh, we are not experts. And uh, so help would be most welcome. And uh, for instance, you may have noticed that uh, I did not release Windows binaries uh, for 3.11.1 and 3.11.2. So I've been lazy, and it's a bit of an experiment. I'm waiting to see how many people are complaining and, uh, and hoping that someone will complain so loudly that I can tell, well, why don't you do it yourself? Uh, but so far, that uh, cunning plan uh, hasn't worked uh, well. So. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe, maybe it will work at some point. Um, and then, well, there's also some community efforts that you may want to join. Um, so when, when a RIA where that, that I think is important for Camel is, uh, is the uh, packaging and distribution of uh, Camel libraries and tools and uh, where there are uh, ongoing projects like well, the Debian packages, uh, Godi, uh, uh, Sylvain Legal is going to, to present uh, a new proposal that looks quite exciting. Uh, but especially when it comes to packaging and distribution, that's really a community work. That's not the kind of work that one person can do uh, alone. Okay, and so it would be good to have some uh, some community efforts around this. And well, by all means, uh, keep up the good work that you're doing with Camel. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions, uh, comments, uh, discussions. Who's first? Yes. Uh, if we want to use this, do we just check it out of CVS or are there tables? Uh, okay, so it, it says VN now. Um, so yeah, so so in the in the subversion trunk at this point, there's uh, all the extensions except this one, which uh, uh, sits in a branch, and uh, so Jacques Garrigue is going to merge it very quickly. Uh, so yeah, currently he's at some kind of meeting in a Japanese uh, resort, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how much uh, internet access he has in his uh, Ryokan, but, uh, but when, as soon as he's back, that will be merged as well. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> In the, um, so why, why is the signature required in the module, uh, local module uh, expression? Uh, that's a good question. Um, let's see, and, and maybe uh, Alan will, will uh, correct me. Uh, I guess so when you, definitely when you build, uh, when you build, uh, when you inject a module into a first class value, okay, so the type inferred, module type inferred for that module can be, well, can be of that form, but it can also be uh, just a signature given in extension or, or something complicated, okay. So basically it's important that the user says explicitly, I want to see that module with this particular <coughs> package type, because that package type then goes into, into the type of the first class value. And so for projection, I guess, I guess, I guess, uh, yeah, so now you need to infer 
Uh, in the worst case, uh, you don't know of any type for X that can be alpha, okay, and then you need to infer a type uh, and uh, of that form. And uh, well, basically, the type checker again needs your help in in uh, in saying uh, uh, this is the package type that I'm expecting, okay. Uh, in, in, in particular cases, it could infer it, but in general, it couldn't. So yeah, that's a little bit verbose, but again, that's a module language, right? It's a module where you say, uh, that's a language where you say things. Uh, but, uh, well, by, by, we are just using names. I mean, these are basically names, possibly with, with, uh, with some constraints, so, so these are not too big, uh, as far as annotations go. Yes. Microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any subtyping in uh, at the at the um, uh, core language level? No, uh, I don't think so. So you mean between those types? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. Is there any? No, I don't think so. Right. That's yeah. easy to implement, I guess. <laughs> 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 I don't like those answers. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, yes, yeah. Right. So so yeah. M maybe maybe that could be merged with, uh, included within the uh, yeah the explicit uh, subtyping uh, uh, that we have in the core language. Uh, <coughs> well, we'll see if there's a need. Uh, Question here. So first of all, thanks for all these features. Most of them are really life changing for uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us. Uh, a question about uh, the the bang operator in yes. uh, classes. So what is the semantics of inherit bang? Ooh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure uh, because well that was uh, so 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 did you do that in your in your first extension or is that or was that added by Jacques? That that was added by, by Jack. The, the meaning is that uh, this specific inherit overrides some fields, some methods from a, pre a, pre a previous one. So if some you methods, so not all of them. Some. So, so, some of them, yes. Okay. Yes, I was wondering if there's any uh, plans for support for uh, integrating OCaml Spotter or some other richer mm. uh, type annotations. So yeah, that, that's one of the topics we discussed at the uh, consortium meeting. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, we don't really have a plan of action uh, yet. Um, so I think everyone agrees that. Uh, well, the compiler should uh, should generate uh, abstract syntax tree uh, annotated with types and locations and so on. So some kind of rich uh, uh, rich version of the of the abstract syntax. So currently we have a little bit of that in the uh, annotation files, uh, the one you obtain with minus d types, uh, but but uh, that's somewhat incomplete and kind of specialized towards just displaying the type of an expression when you click on it. Uh, uh, so basically, we are we are definitely open in uh, in uh, towards extending uh, those uh, these uh, annotation files, uh, those produced by minus d types, and uh, try to put uh, kind of the union of the features that, that people need. Uh, but again, uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that that would have to be some kind of cooperative effort uh, between uh, yeah, uh, Camel Spatter and. Uh, uh, the other project that um, that was done at uh, Orsay before, and whose name escapes me, and um, and so on. Uh, and yeah, so there are certainly a bit of um, engineering to 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 define a common format and then implement it. So yeah, if you're interested, I just just try try to join forces uh, with the, like the two or three. Uh, existing uh, uh, proposals, and then I would be very happy to, to integrate this. There is an, an incompatibility uh, introduced by OCaml 3.12, uh -huh. which is uh, when you have open format in your existing ah. programs. Yeah, 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 well, this... This one uh, is gone, I believe. I was informed. Oh, at, any, uh, at any rate, it will not be in 3.12.0. So yeah, that was an, in, uh, an intentional um, uh, 
extension of the format interface that, that well, that was an extension of the format interface that caused an unintentional um, uh, hiding with uh, pervasive and uh, and yeah, that buzzard surprisingly many that broke surprisingly many programs. So so we are we we are backtracking on this, or maybe we have already backtracked on that. Uh, Someone told me about a, com a recent commit uh, that seems to be fixing the issue. The issue is still open on the Camel BTS. Pardon me? The issue is still open on the Camel BTS. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it will be closed uh, in due time. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Hello? Open <laughs> bang. Rejected. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so well, thanks a lot. Thanks again. We are five minutes ahead of time. That's good uh, for a timely lunch. And anyway, I will be here all day. So, uh, looking forward to uh, continue uh, discussing. Thank you.